All right, everyone, I'm going to get started. Uh, I'm Mark Varian, a research archaeologist here at the Crow Canyon Archaeological Center, and I'm very uh, excited to be the, the moderator for this web Crow Canyon's webinar tonight. Uh, the webinar is tired, titled Kuyamunge. How did I do with that, Scott? Not too bad. Kuyamunge. Thank you. As a center place, and it's by Dr. Scott Ortman. Next. Um, a few logistics first. Um, you're going to have a split screen, and you can drag that bar over to the right to maximize the size of the display of Scott's presentation. You can minimize the size of the talking heads, and you can move those up and out of the way of the presentation. There is a live uh, transcription uh, on the bottom if you need it. Um, I think if you click on the button that says live transcript, you can also turn that off if you want to turn it off. We'll take question and answers on the uh, at the end of the talk, and there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and you use that to type in your questions. If you're having any difficulty uh, with uh, the Zoom feed, you can go to Crow Canyon's uh, Facebook page at that address, crowcanyon.org backslash Facebook, and it's uh, you can pick up the talk there too. Um, you can also view this talk. We will publish it on Crow Canyon's YouTube channel uh, tomorrow so that if you have to leave or if there's parts of the talk that you want to uh, view again, you can look at this talk or any of our Thursday webinars on that channel. Okay. Um, this is being brought to you by the Crow Canyon Archaeological Center. I imagine most of you who have tuned in uh, know something about our organization, but some might not. We're located just outside of Cortez, Colorado. This is a picture of our campus with the uh, iconic Sleeping Ute Mountain in the background. And our mission is to empower present and future generations by making the human past accessible and relevant through archaeological research, experiential education, and American Indian knowledge. And I'd really encourage you to check out our website. We've just redone it, and uh, there are lots of educational materials. And we publish all of our research on that website. Next. Crow Canyon Archaeological Center wants to acknowledge the Pueblo Ute, Paiute, Diné, Hickory Apache people on whose traditional homelands this institution sits and upon which we work and reside. Our mission related work would not be possible without indigenous people in the past, present and future. And we respectfully recognize and honor ancestral and descendant indigenous communities for their contributions to all humankind. Crow Canyon is grateful to all indigenous people and supports the preservation and protection of cultural traditions, ancestral connections, and sacred lands. Uh, we've had a really generous uh, board member who made a $50,000 challenge match to allow us to do these webinars every um, every uh, Thursday. So for every dollar you get, uh, that donor will donate up to $50,000. We're currently at $37,210. So we've got a ways to go uh, to get there by the end of the year. So if you enjoy these webinars and you're able to support them with a financial contribution, we would be very grateful. Thank you. Um, as I said, they're every Thursday. Y'all, most people probably know that. They've been really, uh, something that I've come to rely on for just learning about what's going on uh, in the profession and in the greater uh, topics that we cover. Uh, really excited about an upcoming uh, webinar on September 30th. Um, it's called Ask an Archaeologist. And uh, I didn't write down all of the people. I know that Tim Wilcox, Liz Perry, Ben Bellarado, and a few other archaeologists are going to be on there, and you will be able to interact with them and ask questions about the archaeology of this region and the 
greater topics relative to archaeology that you have. Then on October 7th, uh, we're going to have a presentation by Dr. Michelle Turner, who's a postdoctoral scholar at Crow Canyon. And the title of her talk will be The Wallace Great House Assemblage, an update from the Lakeview Community Archaeological Project, uh, which will be really exciting. That's the uh, core research that we have uh, going, our current research here at Crow Canyon uh, that's going on now. Next. Um, we also, the, um, all of us have been hit hard by COVID, and that's particularly true for the Native communities in our region. These are a number of websites that you can contact in order to see what you can do to help those communities uh, by making a financial contribution to their efforts. There's the uh, Pueblo Relief Fund, Hopi Relief Fund, Navajo and Hopi Families COVID Relief Fund, and the official Navajo Nation COVID-19 Relief Fund. Those are the links that you would use to get to those uh, organizations to uh, contribute to these efforts. And this is a good example of where you might not have something to write this down, but you can go back to uh, this talk when it's published on the YouTube channel and pull up this slide and, and find these addresses and look at these links and see the good work that these various uh, organizations are doing. Next. All right, that brings us to uh, starting the talk. Uh, it's going to be by Dr. Scott Ortman, a longtime friend and colleague of mine. Scott is an associate professor of anthropology at the University of Colorado Boulder, a research associate of the Crow Canyon Archaeological Center, an external professor at the Santa Fe Institute, and associate editor for anthropology and archaeology at Science Advances. That's a lot. He's also a fac faculty affiliate of the CU Population Center and director of the Center for Collaborative Synthesis and Archaeology within the Institute of Behavioral Science at the University of Colorado Boulder. Scott's current research focuses on the contemporary relevance of archaeological research and findings. He's author or co-author of numerous papers on Pueblo Indian historical anthropology, archaeological demography, and complex systems approaches in archaeology. He, his publications also include several books, including Winds from the North, Tewa Origins in Historical Anthropology, Painted Reflections, Isomeric Design in Ancestral Pueblo Pottery, and Reframing the Northern Rio Grande Pueblo Economy. Uh, so it's an honor to have Scott talking to us tonight, and uh, that means, Scott, we're going to quit sharing this screen, and you can pull yours up and begin your talk. Really excited to hear what you have to say. All right. Thanks, Mark, and uh, thanks to all of you for being here. So let's see when uh, if I can share my screen. Are you done sharing yours? Um, so Dylan, is that, do I need to... Yeah, you can go ahead. Okay. I'll just go into mine. Everybody see that? We see it, but it's the slide view. Yep, there it is. Is there? Are we on? All right, great. Great. Well, thanks again, Mark, and, and thank you uh, to Crow Canyon for. Uh, uh, giving me the opportunity to share uh, some of the things that uh, I and a bunch of uh, a bunch of people from many Tewa villages have been learning together, uh, working in uh, at ancestral sites in in uh, northern New Mexico. Um, yeah, I want to especially thank Crow Canyon since I have the floor for for doing these webinars uh, for gosh, it's more than a year now. Uh, I agree with Mark. I've learned so much about what's going on. Uh, in uh, in the greater southwest by tuning into these uh, i can't come every week but but uh, every time that i do i i feel like i uh well let me put it this way i feel like i've been i've been uh missing out by uh not being one of the people that has presented in this series yet and so i'm i'm really pleased to be able to uh, join the join the great club of speakers who have shared their work with uh with the public through this uh through this venue uh, to be uh, talking about this afternoon is uh, emanating from a project that uh, I've been doing with the uh, Pueblo Pwaki, 
uh, for the last oh seven or eight years now. We call it the CU Milwaukee Youth Culture Camp. Uh, it's a, a program where uh, uh, archaeologists like me, uh, some of my students from CU Boulder, uh, young people from the Pueblo of Pewaukee and elders from Pewaukee and other Tewa villages have all gone into the field to work together in partnership to uh, learn about ancestral sites, to document and learn about ancestral sites on Pueblo land and in the area close to uh, the villages today in northern New Mexico. Uh, you can see some of the kind of guiding principles of the project here. Uh, to increase awareness of ancestral sites uh, in the, in the uh, Pueblo population, to strengthen the historical consciousness of, of the Pueblo, uh, to expose uh, young people and elders to what contemporary archeology span is like. Um, you know, I, uh, of course, like all fields, it's uh, evolved and I'd like to think it's improved over the decades. And so sometimes, uh, uh, perceptions of, of what contemporary archaeology is like are uh, need to be updated with people that don't get to interact with archaeologists every day. And so uh, we're trying to do that. In our project, we're also uh, providing informal STEM education opportunities for uh, students in the villages. Uh, STEM stands for science, technology, uh, engineering, and mathematics. And uh, one of the key principles of our work is that we are working to integrate um, what archaeologists uh, can learn from applying the techniques that uh, we know uh, about ancestral sites with the things that Tewa people know through uh, the traditional knowledge that is maintained in the communities. And, uh, you know, our, our goal throughout has been to take both kinds of evidence seriously and to put them into conversation with each other uh, and to see what sorts of things we can learn by working together that uh, we couldn't learn just through archaeology or just through uh, traditional means. Uh, and we call this approach a partnership model um, where, uh, you know, I would say it, it's, um, it's more of a long-term relationship kind of model for doing research where it's not like we have a specific question per se that we want to answer or, or a project where we know when we're done or that we even have one thing to answer, but that uh, just a, a commitment to, um, working together over a period of time and to for, for everyone involved to take from the project what uh, what they think is most important and most is most interesting. One of the main areas where we've been working is uh, is an ancestral site known today in English as Kuyamungay. Uh, and uh, this is the area that I'll be focusing on in my talk today. Uh, the work we've been doing together here involves uh, mapping the area with uh, unmanned aerial vehicles or drones. Uh, it involves doing intensive surface archeology. span So that means uh, walking around with GPS units and uh, closely mapping everything that we see, picking, uh, identifying all the artifacts that we see, placing them on a map uh, so that we can visualize uh, the whole area based on uh, that we see when we're walking around. Uh, Kuyumunge, there was, has been some previous archaeology done at Kuyumunge. Uh, it occurred mostly in the 1950s, and there are collections from that work uh, curated at the Center for New Mexico Archaeology in Santa Fe. So we have been uh, reanalyzing those collections. Uh, and as I've mentioned already, we've really focused on the idea of co-investigation and discussion of, of, of each other's ideas and observations uh, through this process. And uh, most recently, we've uh, uh, one of uh, my students, Caitlin Davis, has been doing a soil sampling project uh, at Kuimunge and other sites where uh, we started using a, a core sampler to collect uh, pollen and phytolith uh, information from uh, some of the old field areas. Um, she's working on a, a dissertation on that right now, so uh, you'll have to stay tuned for her results, and perhaps she can be a Crow Canyon speaker uh, sometime soon. Uh, when I started thinking about um, how to organize all of the thing, all of the just amazing and interesting conversations and insights that we've had from working together, I, I, I've, I realized at first I was really quite kind of overwhelmed by them because they they uh, they cover such a broad range of uh, uh, both scientific, empirical, but also philosophical um, ideas, and so in trying to think about how to 
bring this the things that I feel like we've learned together together to share with a larger commun uh, community of interest. Uh, I tried to think about one kind of organizing concept that I could uh, arrange all of this material around and and something that I kept coming back to was um, was the importance of the idea of the center place in communities today. Uh, the the slide here has some statements by uh, Tewa authors uh, uh, about the idea of the center place and about the the home community of or of a pueblo as a center place for life and for people uh, in the community. And uh, you know, those of us who are archaeologists have probably read most of these uh, works and seen these statements before, uh, but. Uh, I do think they're they're quite powerful, uh, and uh, so just to give you a feel for uh, some of the ways that uh, Pueblo people today uh, think about ancestral sites, uh, you know, we could look through a little bit of this text here. Uh, the second bullet point there, uh, you know, a key point here is that you know the Cardinal Mountains and the Cardinal Sacred Lakes they vary even in the same language group. So every village has their own important mountains and lakes and and important points on their landscape. And it's because the mountains and lakes are designated with reference to one's own Pueblo as the center and reference point. Uh, so there, there's a, a sense in which every, every Pueblo community, past and present, arranged its conception of itself and its understanding of life with respect to the, the middle place of the village, right in the middle of the village, uh, with regard to the surrounding landscape, the plants and the animals. Another important point that comes that comes to comes out in thinking about the center place is that the idea that people are not separate from nature and natural forces. Uh, that so when we talk about the the center place, you know, we're not just talking about the center for the the community of people, although of course that is a big part of it, but also the center of uh, other forces as well: natural forces, spiritual forces, plants, animals, and so on. Uh, Today, uh, you know, villages are, uh, uh, the inhabitants of every village have a sense of important points surrounding the, the community where people go to, to pray and to seek guidance and to uh, gather in blessings from different parts of the world. Uh, and all of those places are marked uh, in the area surrounding villages today. Uh, and uh, there's an important concept here that the very, very center uh, of the village is, is referred to in Tewa as Nansipu, or the, the belly root of the earth. Uh, so the idea that, that the village itself is, is the, bell, the umbilical cord, you know, the belly button that ties the community to, to, to the earth, um, our mother. Uh, Another important point that's come out in the literature about the center place or the statements by Pueblo people about it is is the idea that these very important ideas that are central to Pueblo understanding, uh, philosophy, and culture today um, are they are they're marked in different ways on the landscape, but often very inconspicuously. Um, and uh, you know, this is uh, this next bullet point makes an important point: is, is that uh, you know, and this is something that's really come home to me: is that Pueblo people really see that it's better to um, be understated than overstated. Uh, with regard to the important things uh, of life uh, or about the the world and uh, the spirits and things like that. So, uh, you know, there's there's uh, there's interesting there's interesting lessons I think in that for all of us to think about uh, that I'll talk about more in, uh, as we go through the talk. And then this last one is a nice analogy uh, from someone that spoke with uh, Alfonso Ortiz, the famous. Uh, uh, Tewa anthropologist, uh, you know, an earth navel is like an airport. <laughs> so you know how airplanes, no matter where they go, they always have to return to the airport. And it's the same way. All things, games, people, games. I think, I don't think that's right. All things, uh, it's probably plants, animals, and spirits. I don't know how games got there. Always return uh, to the earth navel. Uh, so uh, these are important ideas about the home community in Pueblo culture today. And uh, as I started thinking about how to organize the things that we've learned together, what I wanted to do is think about the sense in which these ideas apply to ancestral sites uh, and the ways in which these ideas are revealed by uh, the physical traces of past behavior in the old pueblos that uh, we've been visiting, like Cuyamungue. Uh, 
So let me tell you a little bit more about uh, Kuyamunge. So in, in Tewa, uh, you know, first of all, Kuyamunge is, the, is sort of a, a Spanish, uh, oh, I don't know, I've got, it's, a, it's a bastardized way of saying Kuyamunge in Spanish. Uh, so the proper Tewa term refers to the stones falling down place, ku stones, yemu falling down ge place. Uh, and this village was inhabited uh, at the time that uh, the Spaniards came into Pueblo, Pueblo life. Uh, it's mentioned in historical documents of the 17th century. Uh, it was known as a visita of Nambe Pueblo in 1641. So that means that a, a priest that was stationed at Nambe would travel to Cuyamungue to say mass uh, in the 1640s. The people who lived in Cuyamungue participated in the Pueblo Revolt in 1680 uh, during the so-called reconquest or the peaceful, quote, peaceful reconquest of New Mexico in 1692. The leader, the Spanish leader of that, De Vargas, uh, baptized 30 children at Cuyamungue on September 30th uh, in 1694. Uh, and the village was finally vacated, according to the uh, documentary evidence, uh, during what was known as the Second Pueblo Revolt of 1696, when uh, a large group of Tewa people resist, again resisted the Spaniards and uh, took refuge on Tuño, uh, uh, one of the important hills uh, near San Ildefonso Pueblo. Uh, in 1952, as I mentioned before, uh, uh, Fred Windorf, uh, an archaeologist, did some excavations at uh, Cuyamugue. Uh, we didn't have not done any new excavations as part of our project, but we have gone back and looked at the field notes and uh, collections from those excavations. So when I start thinking about how to organize uh, the things that we've learned together about, about uh, Cuyamungue and thinking about it as a, a center place for an ancestral community uh, uh, from uh, long ago, uh, I thought I would try organizing the things that we've learned into four big major categories. So uh, four dimensions, let's say, of what made Cuyamungue a center place for the community that lived there. The first part is uh, its location. Uh, the second dimension is uh, the processes of accumulation in that location. Uh, the third uh, dimension of it is interactions that occurred uh, among the people, the plants, the animals, the landscape uh, in this area. And the fourth dimension I want to talk about is something I refer to as simultaneity. Uh, and uh, I'll explain more about that when we get to it. So I'm going to walk through um, each of these four topics and show you some ways in which I think the things that we've learned uh, uh, about Kuyamunge as a center place fall into each of these four categories. So we'll start with location. Uh, the way to think about, first of all, is that of course all of these ancestral sites, all of these ancestral Pueblo communities um, were local face-to-face -face communities. Uh, they were created in a time when the only way people could get around was by walking. Uh, and there was no internet, there was no, no telephones, no Zoom, no Facebook. Uh, you know, what there was was uh, the landscape, people, people you, you had to walk to talk to people. You might leave your mark on the rocks or move things around to give messages, send messages to people. Uh, you could send messages by gifts to people, of course. Uh, but because of that, you know, because it was uh, in this world, you know, it was a lot harder to get around, uh, and it was a lot harder to communicate with other people than it is today, and so. It was very important for uh, the ancestors way back then to create villages in specific spots that were really beneficial, you know, where there was a, a concentration of, let's call it a, a natural endowment or a concentration of blessings from uh, the world of the spirits or the world of nature uh, that made life easier for people who decided to focus on those areas. Uh, and, and you know, a specific location, a specific place then becomes a focus of the thoughts and the energies of the people who decide to settle in that location. Uh, so you know, where things are, how things are arranged with regard to those specific spots really mattered for how well a community could thrive or not. Uh, and so uh, I think what I'm gonna show you is a lot of the things we've learned have to do with uh, people arranging themselves so that they can take advantage of the blessings uh, that were uh, around Kuyamungay. And another important point here 
you know, in this world where it was much harder to move around than it is today, and, and the ability to gather information about the world was much harder than it is now, um, the knowledge that people accumulated over their lifetime and the knowledge a community accumulated over the centuries was much more localized and specific to the environment where the community existed than is true today. Uh, and so uh, look, the location of a village was very important for thinking about the specific knowledge of the people who lived there. So let's see some ways in which this is true. On the left, you can see a map of the area where Kuyumunga is, and I've outlined in black the buildings. It's real small, sort of in the center of the image on the left there. All of the pink reflect areas where there are uh, gravel deposits uh, of old, uh, old water courses that have, that have left gravel deposits that are now on the tops of uh, terraces above the current water courses that you can see there in blue. And you can see there's an interesting uh, little concentration of terraces just to the, uh, to the south, the west, and the north of Kuyamungay, where there are these gravel covered terraces. Uh, what we'll see is that these gravels were actually an important resource uh, for a particular crop that uh, the, the inhabitants of Kuyamungay uh, grew a lot of. Uh, and so there's a nice concentration of these gravels here that, that made those terraces near uh, Kuyamungay useful for that. Uh, on the right side, uh, in, in the darker purple, what you see is all of the spots that you can see in a direct line of sight view back to the main plaza in Kuyamungay. Uh, so the purple, the purple you know, tops of all the hills are all the, all the spots that someone standing in the plaza at Kuyamungay could see if they, as they turned around. And uh, something that's quite interesting is how, uh, if you fast forward to this view of it, you can, if you overlap the pink and the purple, you can see the interesting correspondence between the view shed of uh, Kuyimunge on the uh, south, west, and north, and those gravel terraces. So the land makes a natural little bowl there uh, in the area where Kuyimunge is, which means that uh, Farmers out working on those fields on those terraces uh, long ago could off, most of the time see back into the plaza in the village directly, and of course could easily hear if there was an announcement for uh, something going on in town or if the drums started for a dance. You would be able to hear it, um, you know, anywhere in this area uh, where these old fields were. Uh, you can also see that I have put some nested circles. Uh, around centered on Kuyamungay. Uh, those circles are every 300 meters going from the center of town out. So I think they go out oh, around two, two kilometers or so. And the darker solid line is the area where uh, we have done our survey, where we've, where we've mapped everything uh, that's, that we can see on the ground. So you can see that we've covered most of this area, most of this bowl shaped area uh, where there are gravel covered terraces that you can see uh, from the village itself. Now, of course, another obvious thing looking at where Kuyumunga is, is this nice pocket of floodplain just to the east of the village. Uh, the, the, the water course that goes by to the east of Kuyumunga is known as Tsuki Creek today. Uh, it's named after Teitsuge Pueblo, Teitsuge Owinge, which is just to the uh, south here off of the map. But you can see there's a spot where the, where the uh, where the floodplain fans out and produces a nice bot, well-watered bottom land. Uh, here's some images of what it looks like. Uh, so uh, the water table in this bottom land is really only a few feet at, you know, at most below the surface. And often in some spots, it, the water just bubbles up um, onto the surface of the ground uh, as the water table comes up and down. Uh, so there are lots of good natural springs uh, in this area, and it's really easy to get to water in the floodplain if you just take a shovel uh, and start digging for a little while. Uh, you can see the, our ma a map of the village here on the, on the image on the right, and you can see the course of Tasuki Creek and this nice bottom land there that uh, would have obviously been very good for also for growing crops. So there is clearly a concentration of blessings. Uh, uh, in this area right around Kuyamunge, there's a nice terrace right above a floodplain that has lots of water and springs 
and a bunch of gravel covered terraces that have direct line of sight views back to where the village is. Um, surely all of those things were part of the reason that uh, the community took shape at Kuyamungay uh, long ago. But there's other kinds of things that we noticed as we were working uh, that I think were also important in the minds of Pueblo ancestors uh, who in, in thinking about, you know, committing themselves to this particular location. Um, as we, as we uh, documented uh, the, the ancestral site, uh, we found lots of stones that look like this. Uh, and, uh, the, you know, they are, they are stones that have been shaped by natural forces to take on the likeness of an animal or some other being that would be have been important in the environment that uh, Tewa ancestors experienced. So uh, the, the larger image there on the upper left looks to me like a person. Uh, we have an image of a bison, of a bear, of a badger, of an eagle. Um, and these are all, you know, stones that are there at Kuyamungay that, uh, you know, uh, the the elders that we worked with found to be every bit as important, believe, you know, every bit as important as the broken pottery and other kinds of uh, features that we found. Um, you know, one of the one of the things that I have had to unlearn by working uh, with Tewa people on this project is uh, one of the first things that, that is part of an archaeologist training, which is distinguishing distinguishing between quote, cultural and, quote, natural things. Uh, and if you think about it for a moment, uh, that basic division, you know, expresses a fundamental division of reality into the world of humans and the world of other things. And it sets humans apart from uh, everything else in creation as being somehow different and not a part of everything else. Uh, if you remove that assumption and think about the world, the, the human community as being a part of the natural world and as being one with the animals and the plants and the wind and the rocks and the mountains and the hills, well then the fact that, that those non-human forces have created objects like this that uh, take on the likeness and the spirit of the animal um, becomes an important sign of the of the beneficial actions of that of that world of that world of the spirits uh, in this area, uh, and so uh, I'm sure that the that the old ones that settled around Kuyamunge came across stones like this and interpreted them also as signs that uh, the world of the spirits had concentrated blessings in this area that made it a good place to live. Um, so uh, you know, some of you may have have encountered the concept of the fetish. Uh, in the past, and uh, uh, you know, you can go and buy those in stores today, uh, in trading posts, and so on. Uh, you know, my understanding of the, this concept that's developed from working uh, on this project is that the the spirit of the animal is already in the rock uh, before it's picked up, and the human action simply finishes it. Uh, and so, when you you know, the, the, a fetish is something that already has that spirit that has been imparted to it by uh, by the non-human world. Uh, and uh, so we found plenty of evidence of that in our survey at Kuyamungi. Um, I mentioned that uh, knowledge is also localized in communities like ancestral Pueblo communities because of the fact that people were so tethered to their home community and it was so time, time consuming and expensive, energy and food and other things like that to walk, um, to walk long distances. Of course, people back then were in very good shape and they walked a lot farther in an average day than we do today. But nevertheless, I can get in my car and drive you know, 300 miles before dark today. And there's no way a person could physically do that back then. Uh, so one of the things that will happen is that uh, people will observe their environment every day and in all kinds of weather at all times of the day. And as they're doing everything that they do uh, in their lives. Uh, and because of that, uh, you know, the, the people of Kuyamungay and of any other ancestral community uh, would have become very closely attuned to this, the real, the specific details of their exact location uh, where they lived. And just one expression of that is shown here on this map. Um, the triangles show the important uh, directional peaks in uh, Tewa culture, uh, Seishuping, Sikumuping, Okuping, and Kusenping. 
those are the four uh, cardinal mountains. Uh, and you can see I've colored in the arrows to each one according to the color that goes with those directions also. Uh, you can see three of the four uh, cardinal mountains from uh, Okuping, not Okuping, sorry, Sikumuping and Kusenping. You can see those three. Uh, Okuping or Sandia Peak is the only one that you can't see from the village area itself. Uh, and uh, you can see I've shaded in some triangles there uh, emanating from either side of Kuyumunge. Those triangles are marking the uh, extent of the travels of the sun in the morning and in the evening over the course of the year when viewed from Kuyumunge. Uh, so uh, for example, Kusenping, the uh, east mountain there, is you can see within the range of travel of uh, the sunrise uh, during the morning. And of course, you know, obviously the sun is closer to Kusenping in the summertime when it rises in the northeast. And when the sun sets in the summertime, it sets close to Sikamuping uh, when viewed from Kuyamunge. Uh, so those sorts of uh, relationships between landforms and the motions of the sun and the moon and the stars were all sorts of things that uh, the inhabitants of Kuyumunge would have learned and uh, and come to uh, understand over the over the over the generations of living in this place. Uh, just to give you a feel for you know what this looks like, thinking about the extreme localization of knowledge of the landscape. Uh, these are images of the sunrise at three different times of the year from the same spot in the middle of Kuyumunge. So on the top is the summer solstice sunrise. Uh, in the middle is around the equinox. Uh, so the beginning of fall, the beginning of spring around this time of year. And the, the image at the bottom is in uh, midwinter. Uh, as you can see the three uh, positions of the sun there over the course of the year. Kusenping is a, is a is, uh, you can see it best actually in the uppermost uh, image. It's it's sort of glowing on in the distance. It's it's on the far horizon, just to the right of the sun uh, as it's rising there. You can see it's kind of golden uh, in the distance there. So that's that's actually where the East Mountain is when viewed from uh, Kuyamunge. All right, the second uh, concept I want to think about is uh, I call it accumulation. Uh, so, of course, you know, there's, there's this extreme, you know, a community that was very localized and tethered to this particular location over many generations. And over that time, then people put a lot of energy uh, and effort into building their lives there, creating things, uh, creating a community, creating the, the buildings and the fields and uh, growing the food and clothing and uh, gathering the resources that they needed to, uh, to, to sustain their lives. So over time, there would be an accumulation of, of the products of uh, people's energies and efforts uh, in these locations. Uh, and in, but in addition to accumulation of physical things, uh, food, clothing, adobe, uh, other raw materials, there's also the accumulation of knowledge and experience uh, that would have uh, taken place over time. Now, there's a there's a wonderful Tewa proverb that says, you know, your your good work comes back to you, uh, and uh, I think that's that's one way of thinking about uh, this idea of accumulation. You know, people putting effort into things, and uh, as a result, the, the the results of those efforts grew for the people who lived here in the past. But an important point here is that, of course, it takes time for things to accumulate. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes continuous effort over a long period of time for a community to really become established uh, and to, for the conditions for it to thrive to really come into place. Um, I'm, I'm showing you the map of the, of the site of, of Kuyumunge here, and I wanted you just to see uh, you know, the way that we were able to find all of the walls of the village. Uh, it turns out that uh, when we took our first imagery uh, of the site using the drone, it was during the summer monsoons and uh, it had just rained a lot. And because of that, there were, there were plants growing out of uh, the old alignments of the adobe walls. So although you couldn't see them when walking around on the ground from the air, they were very clear. And that allowed us to directly map all of the rooms of the village that you see here in their exact locations. Uh, so. Uh, pretty amazing. We were able to uh, l learn all of this without uh, any excavation at all. 
Uh, so one of the things that accumulated over time, of course, is the is the raw materials from all of the houses uh, that that were built uh, to to uh, accommodate the people that lived at Kuyamunge. Um, these are a couple of uh, plots that show the relationships between the uh, different dimensions of the adobe mounds uh, that we uh, mapped at the site. Uh, and uh, so at the top, what we have is a, a re the relationship between all of the adobe, the square meters of adobe uh, that we measured on the ground, and the number of rooms that we could see in the photograph. Uh, and uh, what you can see is all the blue ones are the room blocks or the house mounds of the village where all of the rooms are preserved and visible. And you can see what a, what a close relationship there is between the uh, amount of adobe, the area of adobe, uh, that accumulated at the village over time and the number of rooms that are there. There are a few house mounds where the rooms are either partly visible or there's been some erosion. And in those cases, you can see they fall off of that overall relationship. But uh, in all the well-preserved cases, there's a really nice relationship there. Uh, in the lower plot, you can see the relationship between the adobe area and the volume of adobe. So the, the three-dimensional volume of all the adobe that piled up where these houses are over the centuries. Uh, and uh, there's also two very nice relationships there where you can tell the difference between the one story mounds and the two story mounds just by seeing where each mound falls in these relationships here. So, so one of the things that accumulates certainly is just the building materials that people gathered from uh, appropriate spots, gathered it up, piled it up to make the houses that uh, people lived in. Uh, these are some of the stratigraphic profile drawings of the excavated areas of Kuyamungay from uh, Fred Wendorf's excavations in 1952. And you can see here how uh, over time there was an accumulation of houses uh, in these in the main area of the village. You can see layers of houses and floors stacked up on top of each other over the centuries. So, you know, the people living in those uppermost uh, banks of rooms at the tops of those mounds were living on, on you know, what was already an archeological site, of course. Uh, they were living on top of the houses of their ancestors that had previously lived at Kuimungen. So uh, you can see this also as an expression of the accumulating experience of the population and of the community that uh, resided here. One of the other things that, that uh, you can see walking around uh, Kuimungen is an accumulation of, of uh, artifacts of broken pottery and uh, Chip stone and things like that that are byproducts of people uh, going about their daily their daily life over many centuries. Um, as part of this project, we we use that information uh, to reconstruct the population history of Kuyamungay. Uh, and uh, the way we thought about this is that um, you know there are different styles of pottery that archaeologists have learned date to different centuries, different time periods. Uh, we can count how much of different varieties of pottery was deposited around Kuyamungay um, by walking around and tabulating uh, the different varieties that are present in different locations. Uh, on the map on the left, all of those are the black circles or the spots where we tabulated pottery. Uh, and what you can do is add all of that up to get a feel for how much pottery uh, was deposited around Kuyamungay in by century or by by generation or by 50 year periods and so forth. And so from doing that, we were able to reconstruct this population curve that you see in the, in the chart there. Uh, what we found is that the, the first people to move into Kuimunge moved in there around 1150 or so. Uh, and that there was a, a small, a few families lived there until around 1250, at which time the community began to grow very rapidly. Uh, by about 1350, there were almost 700 people, around 700 people living uh, on this on these two mesas here. And then in subsequent centuries, the population settled back down to between you know, around 300 people. Uh, and then uh, in the 1600s, after the arrival of the Spaniards, the community shrank again as, uh, as Pueblo people uh, dealt with the difficulties of the Spanish uh, entrada. Uh, but in addition to under, you know, getting a feel for the overall history of Kuyamungay and how long people, the Te Tewa ancestors lived here, um, we were able to look at where these different varieties of pottery occur. And that gave us a sense of how the community developed over time. Uh, so just to give you a, a quick example of this, um, 
in these plots I'm going to show you, the darker shade of blue means denser deposits of pottery of the age that you see on the upper right of the slide. So this is the distribution of pottery dating between 1200 and 1250. Uh, and uh, uh, what you can see here is that it's really concentrated in a number of small houses uh, on the southeastern corner of the eventual village here. Now, the, the village you see here is all of the buildings that we have mapped by working together, but not all of these buildings were inhabited at the same time. I'll show you in a moment um, what we what our best guess is as to how the village developed. But so if you if you just remove the, the if you kind of let your eyes blur with regard to the buildings themselves and just think about where the pottery is. Uh, initially, it looks like Kuimunge began as a small settlement of a few families in that southeastern portion of the of the of the mesa but then uh, a second uh, village began to grow uh, during this time up on this northern mesa here and that became much more clear uh, in the middle decades of the 1200s into the early 1300s so that you can see during that period of time there was a lot of pottery being uh, deposited at the northern uh, pueblo there and then you can see the focus of pottery deposition or consumption or use in the southern pueblo uh, shifted a little bit north from those that original area of small houses into a, a second sort of informal plaza looking area. Uh, and then uh, in the 1300s and 1400s, uh, the, there was not much pottery being deposited anymore in that northern village. And the area where it was being used most uh, was in this big plaza area to the west side of the main village to the south. Uh, this is when Kuimunge was probably uh, at its peak. And then finally, in the uh, 1600s, after the arrival of the Spaniards, the community coalesced back into uh, some of these larger house mounds uh, in the southeastern portion of the village there. We can look at this a different way uh, using a 3D model that we created of uh, the site area. So this is what Kuimunge looked like in the uh, around 1200 or 1150 to 1200, a, a collection of small houses uh, at the edge of a terrace above the floodplain of uh, Tasuki Creek. Uh, and then in the late 1200s, uh, the community grew quite a bit uh, and a second village was established in that northern uh, uh, little mesita up on the upper right of this slide here. And then the population of the southern mesa uh, coalesced into a second little village that you see there uh, a short ways to the north of where those older houses were. So at this period of time, around 1300, uh, Kuimungi was a, a paired village community. Uh, in subsequent uh, decades, those two villages coalesced into this village here. Uh, this is uh, the, when, uh, when Kuimungi was at its largest extent. You can see here that there's a sort of a two plaza arrangement. Uh, the western plaza to the uh, upper left of the slide it was the bigger one, and the eastern plaza was the smaller one. And you can see the multi-story room blocks uh, and the long lengthy ones uh, forming these nice plaza areas. And then finally in the 1600s, uh, that village coalesced back into those two main room blocks in the near the eastern edge of the mesa again. So uh, here's, a, here's a summary of that history here. And, and um, you know, one thing that I think is uh, important to think about is that, so what accumulated here was of course, pottery, adobe, you know, the buildings and houses that people created. But what also accumulated here was uh, the memories that go along with this history. Uh, so the people who lived in Kuyumunge, let's say in the 1600s, uh, could walk around their village and physically see the traces of, oh, well, in, back in the past, at one time, our, our community existed as this paired village community uh, of the, the one that the, looked like the village that you see in the upper right here. Uh, and uh, so the knowledge of the history of the community became manifest in the physical remains that the inhabitants of that village lived among. Uh, and, and so uh, there's an accumulation of knowledge and history uh, that took place uh, in this location uh, that 
uh, Pueblo ancestors were very much aware of and lived with every day. Um, and one thing that I think is especially cool that we realized is that um, the, the, uh, this history of Cuyamungue that we have reconstructed here uh, really resonates with some elements of the story of uh, Tewa history that is known that every young Tewa person learns uh, when they're growing up, uh, you know, and that has been shared with me and has appeared in many publications over the years. The basic outline of the story is that the you know Tewa ancestors in the beginning lived in the distant north, and then they migrated down to the south into northern New Mexico from that distant homeland as summer people and winter people and that the uh, winter people came first uh, on the east side of the Rio Grande and the summer people came second on the west side. Uh, and that the winter, uh, and that eventually, uh, this, you know, the two, initially the summer and the winter people built separate villages, but eventually uh, the two came together to form a single village. Uh, it seems to me that the, the people who lived in Cuyamungue uh, in the 1400s, 1500s and so on, you know, probably knew that story and could walk around their home community and see the physical traces of it uh, for themselves. Uh, so an accumulation of knowledge in history as well as of physical things. Another thing I would say is that the, the accumulated, um, you know, these accumulations of artifacts and other things that people created then became resources that uh, Tewa ancestors could use to continue their lives. Uh, the best example of these are these uh, shirred trowels that we found when we were mapping uh, a lot of the field areas. So these are pottery vessels that began their lives as vessels for eating food out of. Uh, and when they wore out uh, and fragmented into, into sherds, uh, a farmer picked them up and used them as a trowel. Uh, to uh, work their gardens and to help uh, grow their crops, uh, to help them make a living uh, in the next generation. Uh, so, uh, of course, none of those none of those shirred trowels would be there if there wasn't an ancestor making a pot and using it and having it wear out before that farmer picked it up and used it as a tool. Uh, and extending the line of thinking even further. Of course, the natural forces uh, the nat and the spirits that created these uh, shaped stones that are pr properly sized for someone to use as a hand stone for digging, the previous efforts of the non-human world left those things at Kuyamunge for the people to use to help make their lives easier. Uh, so both people and non-human forces uh, contributed to creating an environment that uh, was, uh, was useful and helpful for the human community. I thought I'd show you a little bit more about the uh, field areas that we documented here. So of course, part of, you know, one of the dimensions of accumulation is physically growing things. Uh, Kuyamungay and other uh, ancestral table people made a living by farming. Uh, and uh, these are some of the agricultural features that we found uh, when we did our survey. Uh, some the the areas that have are cleared of gravels and and, and uh, plants are areas that we call borrow pits. So these are spots where a farmer has collected the gravel and that has accumulated naturally and spread it out uh, to create a gravel mulch field that was uh, that improved the farming uh, capacity of certain areas. You can see some examples of really nice bordered uh, uh, gravel mulched fields in several of the slides here and. Uh, you know, so, uh, something that you know is very commonly observed in these areas is that the, the these gravel mulch fields continue to work today in the sense that they they capture and hold water uh, to the point that it makes it easier for more plants to grow uh, within the old mulch fields than off of the mulch fields. Um, so the the young junipers that you see there in the, in the mulch field in the bottom uh, the the center bottom. Uh, that's, that's something that we saw in many of the fields that we marked, walked, walked over. And then there's other areas where uh, the grasses grow really well. Uh, you can see in the lower left uh, areas that would have been good for uh, farming based on just the soil moisture without the help of the gravel. Uh, so we refer to those as uh, lus fields. So all different kinds of fields uh, that we found in the survey. Uh, and here's a map of all of those uh, field areas that we found. Uh, walking across roughly a two square kilometer area. Uh, you can see them in different, 
There's a key there in the upper right, and you can see all the different uh, uh, colors there. Uh, and there, one thing that uh, occurred to me, or that I became noticed as I we were making this map, as we were mapping all these field areas, is um, there's a whole lot of them really close to town, like on the first terraces uh, to the south and to the east, uh, to the west, excuse me, of Kuimunge. Uh, there are lots and lots of little field areas, lots of especially little gravel mulch field areas, uh, lots of artifacts, lots of other traces of farming. And as you go walk, keep walking farther away from Kuimunge, what you see is there's more open ground that doesn't have stuff on it. But when you do come across a field area, they seem to be bigger uh, than uh, typical of the field areas closer to the village. Uh, and so the, the plots on the left side illustrate uh, this pattern that we noticed. Uh, so the, the y-axis of the, of the plot in the upper left is the number of features of these different varieties that were found per hectare uh, that we walked over. And they are organized into these concentric circle uh, distance bands. So the 301 is from zero to 300 meters, and then 300 to 600, 600 to 900, 900 to 1200, and so on. So what you can see is that you know the artifacts, these borrow pits, mulch fields, terrace fields, and what we call lust fields, and also the field shrines, uh, the, the blessing places that the farmers use to help the crops to grow, they all became less dense with distance from the village. Uh, and, you know, to some extent, this makes sense, right? There would be more demand for the land close to town because it was a lot easier to get back and forth between town and a, and a field that was close by. So the fields close to town were much more closely packed together than they were farther out. On the other hand, in the bottom left, uh, what you can see is that in those same distance bands, the average size of one of these fields gets bigger as you go farther away from town. So the fields are less dense, but the fields that are there are bigger. Um, I, I suspect what's, what's happened here is, is that uh, the farmers that lived at Kuimunge, you know, they recognized that it took energy to walk a long distance out through the fields and that it was a lot more work to carry things back and forth between town and their fields. And so if uh, probably, you know, people didn't make the trip as frequently if they had to go farther, and if they were gonna walk all that way, uh, they probably wanted to stay there for a little longer, which meant they wanted to farm more land. Uh, so what's kind of interesting is that this pattern here is something that you see actually with regard to uh, housing in cities all over the world today. Uh, you know, in almost every city, houses close to downtown, for example, are small and they're packed together. Sometimes they're apartments stacked up on top of each other. And as you go out from town farther and farther away, you get into the suburbs where houses tend to be bigger and, and the and more spread out. And of course, eventually you get so far out that uh, you're into uh, areas where people don't commute back into the city anymore. Uh, I think you can see some of those same concerns reflected in the ways in which the farmers uh, at Kuimunge organize uh, their activities in uh, producing crops. Now, Another cool you know, or another important Tewa proverb that uh, you know I've learned about through working together is the idea that um, an important concept is to seek is seeking life and especially seeking a life of abundance through hard work, uh, honesty, and uh, care for others and for the environment. And uh, you know one way of thinking about how well uh, Pueblo ancestors at Kuimugi did in seeking a life of abundance is to think about um, how you know the sizes of the houses that they were able to, that they lived in. Uh, so one way to think about this is that all other things being equal, um, if a family is, uh, has more abundant crops, uh, more abundant personal belongings, more clothing, more other things, they will need a larger home in which to keep all of those things. Uh, so all other things being equal, you might expect that a prosperous community would translate into larger houses um, over time. And uh, I think we see, can see that at Kuimunge, actually. Uh, so the, the top, these are, they're called uh, histograms. So, so these are plots where the height of the bar is the number of rooms in the village that is of a certain size. And you can see the size scale at the bottom of these plots. So 5, 10 to 15 square meters. That's the floor area of, uh, of a room. 
So in the early village in the 1250s to about 1400, what you can see is that most of the rooms were between about four and six square meters. Uh, that dashed line is the average of all of the rooms. You can also see that the that the, the distribution of those rooms is sort of skewed. So there's, there's a small number of really big rooms and then a large number of pretty small ones. Uh, over the centuries, what happened is that the average size of a room, of a Pueblo room got larger. Uh, you can see based on the movement of that dash line, the average. And you can also see that it got more symmetrical in the sense that the, the two tails, uh, the, the large ones and the small ones, both became relatively uncommon and more of the rooms became closer to average size. Uh, I actually think this is a trace of the prosperity of the Kuimunge community. Uh, and it's uh, a trace of the fact that, uh, that over time people did accumulate uh, material possessions, of food, clothing, other things, uh, such as they needed larger houses, but also they seem to have done it in a way where everyone shared in that abundance rather than just a few people uh, you know, getting rich while everyone else stayed poor, for example. Uh, so I think that whatever, whatever the people here did, I think it worked. All right, the third idea I want to talk about is uh, interaction. Uh, this is a map that shows Kui Munge and the adjacent communities that were nearby. Uh, of course, you know, they say it takes a village to raise a child. Well, it, takes, it probably takes a region to have a community. Uh, no ancestral Pueblo community was ever entirely self-sufficient. Uh, I mean, at the, at the most basic level, um, over the centuries, it would be important for the young people of Kuimunge to meet the young people in, in adjacent villages to uh, find part, spouses and partners to make sure that they maintain the health of the population. Uh, but it's true for other things too. So interaction refers to exchange and flows between people, of people, uh, between people and plants and animals, and also between people and, uh, and spiritual forces. So let's think about some of the ways that interaction was focused on Kui uh, One way to think about it is the, uh, is the uh, arrangement of houses and plaza space in the village. Uh, so the plot up above shows you the, uh, the average room area. So I've already shown you that one in, in red. And the blue bar shows you the area of plaza space per room in Kui uh, in its early air, early decades, during between 1400 and 1600, and then between 1600 and 1700. And what really jumps out is just the dramatic increase in the plaza space per room, which probably means plaza space per resident of Kuyamunge um, over time. Uh, what it suggests to me is that the community at Kuyamunge, you know, became much more aware of how they benefited from welcoming uh, their neighbors to come and visit for ceremonies and dances and feasts and things like that, the kinds of things that happen in Pueblo still today, uh, and that they created a community that would support that. Um, and uh, you can see some traces of the effects of that that we haven't talked about previously in the slide below, uh, where you can see um, in the artifacts that we tabulated around the village, you can see how how common uh, a variety of pottery called glazeware that was imported to Kui Munge uh, was over the centuries, uh, and or how it changed relative to what it was at the beginning. That's why all of them are one at the beginning, and then it's a ratio relative to one in the middle and late period there. Uh, you can also see that uh, the rate at which people used up the painted white pottery uh, increased quite a bit. Uh, so people did more with painted pottery uh, over time, uh, they used it probably, probably uh, their friends and relatives for meals more frequently, uh, used painted pottery more frequently and thus broke it more frequently. Uh, over time, the people of Kuimungi also became more connected to the larger world. And you can see that through the increasing amounts of obsidian that were brought into Kuimungi over time. So, uh, you know, the, the community definitely put effort into uh, connecting itself with adjacent communities. Of course, another point is that, you know, to be able to interact, you have to physically move. And uh, in the survey, we found many traces of the paths that uh, people and farmers would take as they were uh, walking across the landscape between fields and to visit their neighbors in the fields and uh, 
to walk between uh, between the village and uh, different farming areas. Again, you know, if you think about it, there's all these fields and all these terraces here, you can't just walk however you want to because you're going to be walking over someone's crops. So it's important for people to establish particular paths through which people would walk the appropriate ways to walk across that landscape uh, and uh, to mark the appropriate ways to walk with stones and other markers so that people would know the proper way to move. There's also, we also found evidence of interactions with, of course, spiritual forces. Um, one of the very common uh, findings of the survey was that most of the field areas had um, a special stone, a prominent stone that was uh, set up somewhere in the field uh, that uh, the elders often always interpreted as blessing places, uh, places where the, where the, where the farmer would, um, would uh, say their morning prayers uh, as part of doing their work. Uh, in their fields. And you can see a couple of examples uh, in the pictures here. Uh, what we did in, in the surveys, we documented all of those locations. We figured out the aspect uh, of the land where each of those stones occurs, and we recorded the color of the stones. Uh, and uh, so you can see a summary of all of those stones in the upper left. This is a radial plot. So the bigger the triangle there, uh, the more of these uh, shrine stones there are of a certain color facing a certain direction. And in the upper uh, right, you can see uh, what the landscape overall looks like. So what we did there was just say every 10 feet, what direction does the land around Kuyamunge face? We used a map to calculate all of this. Uh, and so what you can see is that the, these uh, field shrines are much more focused in their orientation than the landscape overall. Uh, they tend to be almost entirely facing from about due east to a little to a little bit northeast um, toward the direction of the sun at the sunrise during the summer months. Uh, so it seems pretty clear that, uh, you know, the farmers in walking out to their fields in the summer months, uh, you know, set up places to uh, interact with the with the sun and the clouds and the wind and the rain to uh, to uh, encourage them to come and help their crops to grow. Uh, you know, something that's also interesting is that there are summer and winter associations of the different colors. And so we've tabulated those in the lower left. And something that is interesting is that uh, the colors of these stones definitely emphasize the summer season. Uh, there are some winter uh, season associated stones uh, in the fields, but, uh, but mostly summer. Uh, so, uh, exactly what the interpretation of this is, is something we're still working on. Uh, it's possible that these colors of the stones relate to the, uh, to the social group, you know, the summer people or the winter people that the farmers belong to. Uh, it could also have something more to do with the, the kinds of the prayers, perhaps, that the farmers uh, uh, needed to give in different locations. Uh, so we're still thinking about that. Um, the people of Kuyimunge, um interacted much farther afield as well. Um, when the first Spanish explorers came into New Mexico, they commented on how Pueblo people all wore bison hide robes uh, to keep warm in the wintertime. And uh, Spanish explorers in uh, the Southeastern United States uh, commented upon uh, running into uh, indigenous people who were wearing cotton clothing that they said they got from uh, the direction of New Mexico. Uh, there are there's not really good evidence of uh, bison herds being close by to Cuyamungue uh, in uh, pre-Spanish times. Uh, there are there were some bison bones found at, in the excavations at Cuyamungue, but they all date from the 17th century after the appearance of the Spaniards. Uh, so there is sort of a question as to how Pueblo people, including the people of Cuyamungue, got all those bison robes that they wore, given that you had to go to the other side of the mountains. Uh, to get to the areas where bison were. And once you got there, carrying bison products back to town would be really hard if you didn't have a horse or wheeled vehicles and things like that. Uh, so what we think is that uh, Pueblo people traded for bison products and they traded something that they had in abundance. And in the case of Cuyamungue, I believe that they traded uh, cotton garments that they grew in all of those uh, mulch field areas that I've been talking about. Uh, this uh, plot here shows uh, the floor plan of one of the kivas that was excavated in the 1950s. Uh, and in, in the lower left version of it, you can see a bunch of uh, 
holes in the ground that are of a loom. Uh, it's their anchors for a loom that was used for weaving cotton garments. Uh, and in the upper uh, left, I've done some calculations of roughly how many cotton mantas the people of Kuyamunga could have woven each year um, based on some assumptions about uh, how closely you could plant cotton plants, uh, where they would be planted and so forth. Uh, and uh, so the bottom line here is, you know, the estimate we came up with is about 100 mantas per year is about what the, the people of Kuyamunga could produce based on the distribution of the of the mulch fields where uh, we think uh, was a primary cotton growing area. Uh, and, you know, at best there might've been 700 people living in Cuyamungue. So, so long as these mantas lasted seven years, at least, uh, you know, uh, the people of Cuyamungue were producing a surplus of, uh, of mantas that could be traded with people on the other side of the mountains. Uh, perhaps even walk, maybe some people from Cuyamungue walked over to Pecos Pueblo, uh, and uh, camped there and traded with the Apaches that came uh, to Pecos to trade, something like that. Uh, one other dimension of interaction that's kind of interesting is, is uh, we found interesting evidence about how Pueblo life changed uh, when the Spaniards came into their world. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the animal bones from the excavations at Cuyamungue from the 1950s focused, well, most of those animal bones came from areas that were inhabited in the 1600s. And uh, there's a large number of cattle, pig, horse, mule, and sheep and goat bones that were included in that. Uh, it's pretty unlikely that all the animals were, were being, uh, you know, were living right there in town because uh, all of those animals would have definitely messed up a lot of the fields. Uh, but we have found traces of uh, what look like stock herding uh, sites, uh, you know, maybe a, a little bit, you know, five, six kilometers away from Kuyamungue, uh, too far, too far for the animals to just kind of randomly wander into the, into the cornfields, uh, but uh, far, but close enough so that when it was time to bring the livestock into town for people to use them, uh, you could probably make that walk in a day. Uh, so this is a site where we found uh, uh, animal trails going off in different directions from a spring toward, one goes toward Cuyamungue, one goes, goes toward Pauaki, a third one goes toward Hakona, and a fourth one goes uh, toward the Rio Grande, uh, probably toward Cochiti, something like that. Uh, and uh, we found pottery of the 17th century there and even some uh, animal bones uh, of uh, domestic animals. Uh, so uh, Pueblo people definitely took to uh, the new, you know, in a sense they, they they incorporated uh, many of the things that the Spaniards introduced uh, uh, into their lives, into their way of life. Uh, and we found evidence of that uh, from our work around Cuyamungue. The, uh, of course, the most important point about any uh, community uh, as a center place is that it relies upon people being kind to each other. And it relies upon people being committed to each other and committed to treating each other fairly and honestly and uh, for mutual benefit, uh, you know, in a, in a non-competitive way, uh, in a fair way. Uh, and so, you know, a, a, cru a crucial component of any successful community is ideas about what the community represents. Uh, and these are often reflected in language. Uh, and I have some examples here to give you a feel for the ways the, the people of Kuyamungay probably thought about the community in which they lived. Um, so I wanted to mention first a couple of, of terms from Latin and Greek that describe some of the ways that those people uh, thought about their communities. So uh, the, you know, the Greek city-state was referred to as a polis or a polis. Uh, and that's an older word for a stronghold or fortress. So uh, you know, in the Greek world, the, the basis of community was common defense against other human enemies uh, is one way of thinking about it. Uh, in, Lat in Latin, uh, a town or a city is, comes from the word for civis, which means uh, a chivis, rather, uh, a member of a community. So a, a civitas is a city. Um, so uh, in Latin, the idea of the community was a place of participation, uh, a, play a group of people who participated in the community life, who were citizens of the city. Uh, the language surrounding communities in, the, in Tewa um, have to do much more with uh, uh, a body, uh, like an integrated body where there are different functional parts that each work together as a whole. Uh, so for example, there's a heart, there's a belly, there's a root. Um, there are 
of course, houses. Uh, the kiva is a house for the whole community. Um, also, there are plant-based metaphors that are important uh, in, in uh, the ways that Tewa people think about community. So uh, many Tewa songs talk about the, the cloud boys and the corn maidens standing upright in, uh, in the middle of the plaza. You know, that's the same verb that's used to describe the growing corn plants. Uh, so the, the people and the plants are one. Uh, the people and the corn are one. Um, so these, these ideas, um, uh, I think, help to convey some of the ways in which, you know, Tewa ancestors talked about the center place uh, when, when Kuimungi was inhabited and some of the ways that they encouraged people to be kind to each other, uh, to seek that life of abundance that we've been talking about. So the final thing I want to mention is um, this idea of simultaneity. And I think this is very important. Um, when when uh, we've worked together, Tewa people and I have worked together at these sites, um, you know, it's very clear that uh, Tewa people see the ancestors as being present in these places. Um, they're still there. Um, and you can see and feel the, the products of their efforts all around, uh, whether it's the whether it's the smoothness of a stone from being rubbed by uh, ancestors from generations ago, or the way in which the old fields encourage uh, plants to grow still today, encourage abundance in nature, even though there's no people there uh, maintaining uh, those fields anymore. And even though no people today directly in a material sense, uh, you know, take advantage of all of this additional growth. Um, those, those values are expressed in songs uh, that are a part of uh, the dances and ceremonies still today. You know, the idea that the, the ancestors desire, you know, proper moral behavior on the part of the community, and that the result of that behavior is a world of abundance for people, but also for plants and animals and everything. Uh, you can see that walking around ancestral sites. You can see how the efforts of the ancestors have encouraged that world to come into being. And so when, when descendant communities, indigenous people go and visit ancestral sites today, those are the kinds of things that come to their minds in my experience. Um, so uh, you know, the actions and values of the ancestors are apparent in these places. The knowledge that they gained over the centuries is apparent. It's manifest in the archeological traces, uh, the, evidence of their lives, the evidence of their growth and prosperity over the centuries. Uh, so ancestral sites become a place for contemporary people to learn to uh, reinforce and renew uh, Tewa values, the values that still guide uh, Tewa communities today. So, you know, Kuyamungi was a center place for uh, the people who lived there in the past. Uh, ancestral sites are center places and centering places for uh, Pueblo people still today. Uh, you know, there's a famous, there's a famous uh, phrase from an anthropologist named Keith Basso it says, wisdom sits in places. Uh, and I think this is absolutely true with regard to ancestral sites. Um, you know, the reality of Tewa tradition is apparent in the physical traces of past behavior in ancestral sites. It's tangible evidence that the stories and their lessons for people today are real. Uh, and so visiting ancestral sites helps to maintain the identity of uh, Tewa people today. It helps to give them direction and purpose in a world that, of course, is continuously changing. Life has changed in so many ways for Tewa people today than it was back when their ancestors lived at Kuyamungay. Um, but I think uh, the fact that Tewa people today can see expressions of enduring Tewa values in these places, uh, in my experience, is very, very uh, galvanizing for, uh, for the communities today. So, you know, I want to wrap up by by talking about um, you know something that was was told to me um, earlier earlier on, early on in my work uh, with Pawaki and other Tewa people um, in preparation for going to a feast day. Uh, this person said to me, uh, "You know, the whole thing is a prayer. Um, the the food that's prepared, uh, the serving of the food, the conversation that you have with the people at the table, the dance, the." the gathering, uh, the moving around, the cleaning up of the houses to prepare for visitors, all of that stuff is a prayer for uh, encouraging the world that all of us want uh, to live in. Uh, and 
you know, through this process, uh, of course, in, in Tewa traditional uh, happenings and doings, uh, the people receive the guidance from their ancestors through the traditions that they, they, they continue to follow today and from their experiencing experiences uh, visiting ancestral sites. The prayers that are offered in the dances are not just for the community, they are for everyone and for everything. So the, the, the knowledge and the effort and action of uh, community members today is all geared toward encouraging uh, a world that uh, conforms to the values of the community. Uh, and uh, I guess what I'd like to say is that I, I can see ways in which doing archaeology in the way that I've been talking about it tonight can, can be a part of this too, by showing ways in which uh, the values of indigenous communities translated into lives of abundance, translated into productive communities and uh, translated into um, prosperity and uh, a sense of belonging uh, and the growth of knowledge. Uh, you know, I think by archeologists helping to illustrate all of that, I think we can also encourage uh, the values of indigenous communities to play a larger role in the world that we all live in today. Uh, so I hope, I hope I leave you, that's the last point I want to leave you with. Um, you know, many people have helped me with this work. Uh, and although I've been the one speaking here, I hope you can hear the voices of many Tewa uh, friends and uh, associates that uh, I've worked with over the past seven or eight years. Uh, um, many people from the Pueblo Pwaki also, uh, you know, I think an important point I want to raise is that uh, Kui Munge is on uh, private land today and it's very well cared for by uh, the Kui Munge Institute, which owns the land. Uh, and uh, I pre really appreciate them being such good stewards of, uh, of this uh, piece of land here in between uh, several Pueblos. Uh, and you can see several other organizations here that have helped support this work. Um, thank you for sticking around and listening to that. And uh, I have a few minutes. I can take some questions if you have any. Thank you, Scott, for that really excellent talk. And thank you to everyone who tuned in uh, this afternoon to, to listen to Scott's talk. Um, we do have a few questions. It's um, starting to push 5.30. We will uh, move through them. Um, I had the question about land ownership, Scott, but you answered it, uh, so I appreciate that. I wondered if you could briefly talk about the were there formal agreements with the Pueblos or a specific Pueblo that were a part of you doing this project? Yes. Um, uh, the project originated from uh, an invitation from the Pueblo um, to, uh, to uh, work with them to develop a uh, heritage program. Uh, so uh, that was the, the genesis of it. And, and the idea to work at Kui Munge originated in, with uh, tribal interests. Uh, the former governor, uh, Joe Talachi, was especially interested in, uh, in working there. Uh, Kui Munge is, like I said, it's on, on private land. Uh, it's uh, very well cared for by the Kui Munge Institute. And, uh, and an important point there is that, uh, you know, the, the site is not open to the public. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it, it's, you know, if you reach out to the Pueblo, uh, you know, you can seek permission to go there that way or through the Kui Munge Institute. But, uh, uh, yeah. What year did you start this research? Uh, it was 2014. Wow, that's great. And what are you, um, how are you working on trying to synthesize it and present it? Mm -hmm. Well, this presentation today is a, is a step in uh, trying to formulate a book that tries to capture uh, the experience of working together and to uh, share and incorporate the voices of Tewa people, uh, as well as the things that I feel like I've learned from uh, working on this project. So uh, it's, it's part way done. It's going to take a little while longer to get it done. And, uh, and uh, you know, the, the plan is for uh, basically for me to draft chapters of it and then uh, have that be a basis for discussion with community members to, uh, to continue to uh, incorporate uh, Tewa voices and input up until the time the final product is done. Oh, that's great. Um, a number of questions came in. And uh, the first one is somebody, when you talked about 
doing the analysis of pottery on the surface, you mentioned dog leash samples and mm -hmm. somebody asked, what is a dog leash sample? Uh, sorry about that. Yeah. What the way to think about it is that you, you pick a point on the ground and then you have a ruler or a piece of string that is a certain length and then you use that to inscribe a circle. Uh, and that's the area within which uh, you would tabulate uh, all of the pieces of pottery that you can see on the ground. So the, the term dog leash is a colloquial term that archaeologists use for a, a circular a pottery uh, collection unit. Now, we all we did was tabulate the pottery and then we put it back uh, in the spot where we where we tabulated it. So we didn't collect anything. We just uh, did the analysis in the field. Great. Um, somebody wrote in who worked on uh, the sites that were excavated when they expanded the highway right of way. Um, mm -hmm. And they mentioned um, that they excavated a pit house that had more than 20 dogs in that pit house. And they wondered if the 1950s excavation at Kuyamungay had uh, any evidence of finding dogs associated with structures. Um, there were no collections of dog remains uh, like the one that the person is mentioning uh, that I noticed in any of the uh, excavation records from Kuyamungay. Um, I think there were some dog bones in the collection, but definitely nothing like uh, that assemblage that I have heard about. Um, uh, it's, um, yeah, that was, that's a, a striking find. Um, so two people wrote in with this question, and it's about you mentioning winter and summer people, and they asked if these are related to moieties, and what's the nature of the relationship between those moieties, if it is. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, it is. Um, you know, there's a long, there's a long and somewhat technical discussion about uh, Tewa moieties uh, in in the in the professional literature. There's a lot of debate about what the right term to use is. Also, Tewa people themselves sometimes use different words than moiety to describe them. But um, the basic idea is that uh, every every you know Tewa traditional Tewa communities are are generally organized in a way that there are two major groups known as summer people and winter people, and that um, each of them has different responsibilities and that collectively over the course of a year, their works come together to make a complete community. Um, today, the summer, summer people and winter people, um, you know, you can marry someone of the same group, same moiety or, or not. Um, there are interesting questions as to whether maybe in the past, uh, the summer people and winter people represented more like two clans where you would need, you know, it was a, not appropriate to marry someone of your own clan, for example. Um, but today uh, they don't regulate marriage as far as I've ever heard from anybody. Thank you. Um, somebody wrote in to compliment you. There's actually several people that uh, remarked on how much they enjoyed the talk. Um, but somebody wrote in and said, this is the first time I've seen this marvelous approach to melding archaeology and native knowledge. How did this idea come about? Who else is for you and uh, who else is using it? That's very kind of the, of the, of the viewer. Um, you know, I think there are many archaeologists that are trying in different ways to um, to respond to the indigenous critique of archaeology um, as a traditionally um, you know, I mean, one way that it's sometimes referred to is that, uh, you know, arche traditional archaeology is a colonialist enterprise. Uh, and I think, you know, to me, where that comes from is um, archaeologists not recognizing that they're non-native archaeologists not accepting and taking to heart that they're dealing with the, the heritage of uh, of indigenous people who are also citizens, uh, and uh, and not taking to heart, you know, the idea that uh, the indigenous community should be a part of our audience, and if it should, and if that's the right thing to do, well, then the next right thing to do is say, well, then you should be doing work that resonates with that audience, uh, and so the best way for, that I found to to move forward with that is to you know, work on building relationships, lasting relationships with uh, with indigenous people and visiting sites together and working together and talking about them together. So and learning more about the lives of of indigenous people in general, so that 
their interests and concerns can come through in the topics that the archaeologists, whether native or not, uh, choose to focus on. Um, so that's the way I think about it. Uh, I think many archaeologists working in the Southwest today are 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 uh, grappling with similar, you know, the same questions uh, that you see reflected in the way I've spoken today. Um, and uh, so I think, you know, I think if you uh, if you uh, uh, dig into the recent literature, you'll find lots of lots of different uh, approaches to uh, to uh, to answering this question. Well, the field of indigenous archaeology is growing and reshaping archaeology. That's for sure. Were there indigenous archaeologists and Pueblo archaeologists involved in this project? Yes. Um, uh, and, you know, both in the formal and informal way, uh, in the sense of uh, tribal members who have a great interest in archaeology and who have read a lot of the literature to, to tribal members who have a lot of experience visiting ancestral sites and are very good at interpreting uh, what we can see on the ground today to uh, tribal members who are pursuing graduate degrees in archaeology, one of whom is a student of mine, um, and, uh, and elders also with a variety of backgrounds and levels of interest and knowledge, uh, both of archaeology or ancestral sites, but also, of course, of stories and place names and the language and I think, uh, tr you know, other traditions and so forth. Great, thank you. Um, which modern Pueblos consider Cuyamungue their ancestral site? Mm -hmm. um, Tosuki and Pawaki are the two villages that are most closely uh, most closely affiliated with uh, Cuyamungue. Um, it's it's pretty clear that um, at least some of the people that lived in Cuyamungue in the 17th century. Uh, ended up moving into Pawaki in the aftermath of the Second Pueblo Revolt. But I do think um, some of the people also moved to Tesuke and are uh, there today. Um, just a couple. Oh, more. I should say one more thing. Oh, I'm sorry. I should say one more thing. Um, in, the, in the historic documentation surrounding Kuimunge, there's also a mention of some member people of Kuimunge uh, moving out of New Mexico and becoming and joining up with Navajo people and becoming Diné people. So. Mm -hmm. It's not unlikely that some descendants uh, are Diné people today. Yeah, I would imagine there could be a, a, a situation where most people moved one place or another, Pahaki or Tasuki, but that some people actually ended up in a, quite a wide variety of places, other Pueblos, mm -hmm. and really interesting that you talk about mm -hmm. this connection to Diné people too. Mm -hmm. um, uh, somebody was interested in your presentation of the animal bones that were recovered, and they asked, is there evidence of pre-Spanish domestication of animals? Yeah, good question. Um, at Cuyamunga and other sites, there certainly are, uh, there's certainly evidence of domestic dogs and turkeys. Um, and uh, that's commonly found not only at Cuyamunga, but at other ancestral sites as well, going, going way back into the past, uh, far beyond, far earlier than time than Cuyamunga. Um, but, um, but horses, uh, cattle, uh, uh, sheep, goats, uh, mules, all of those are domestic species introduced by the Spaniards to Pueblo life. But, but it's pretty clear that Pueblo people did um, take to them pretty quickly. Um, and we've logical evidence of that. Yeah, great. Thank you. Well, we'll finish up with a question from a colleague who wrote, thanks for your presentation, Scott. In a paper you published on this project, I appreciated how you retained the, quote, shadow of earlier, quote, non-occupied room blocks so that one could understand that residents could always see the tangible past of their progenitors. Uh, this strikes me as an important innovation in archaeological reporting. Was it a matter of your field work or conversations with Pohaki participants that allowed you to see that? Hmm. You know, with a lot of these things, I would say that at this point, um, you know, we've had so many conversations and experiences together that I'm not sure where things <laughs> originated yeah. from. What, what I, I'm sure there was a day when we were walking around, and I'm sure, you know, I think it might well have been um, 
one of the Akonge of, uh, of Pewaukee that said, you know, my ancestors saw this mound too, you know, uh, and you know, it probably was sort of, it begins with a, a kind of an offhand comment like that, um, that leads to the realization that, uh, you know, Tewa ancestors experienced an archeological record too, what we call an archeological record. Of course, in their mind, it was a different thing than that. Um, and that, um, that it was a, in the same way that the ancestral sites are a source of knowledge for Pueblo people today, it was a source of knowledge for people of the past as well. And so it only seemed appropriate to present it that way. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I do hope that um, our, the tradition in archeology span has been to show the inhabited sites by time period, and then they sort of disappear off the face of the earth when they're no longer inhabited. And uh, I do think that there's much more to be done with thinking about the accumulation of the archeological record that Pueblo people experienced in the past. Great. Well, thank you very much, Scott. That was a brilliant talk and uh, thanks for your work in um, creating this project that was such an interesting collaboration between archeology span and uh, native knowledge. We really appreciate it. We look forward to having everybody. Uh, thank you for tuning in tonight and we look forward to having you at the next uh, webinar. Uh, next Thursday, where you can ask an archaeologist the questions you have about Southwest archaeology and beyond. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone. You too, Scott.